So, myself and Bob, we'll do an introduction in a minute. We're going to do Sigstor. This is predominantly you know, a little bit of context around why the project started. Not going to go too in depth. There's lots of previous talks on YouTube and good docs that you can reference. Uh, you know, where we are at present and where we hope to be in the future. What are the general trends that we've seen around adoption and so forth. So, I'm Luke Hines member of the Sigstor community, the, the Technical Steering Committee Chair, uh, also the CTO of a startup called Stack Clock, where we use Sigstor in some of our open source projects, and also have Bob. Yeah, Bob Calloway. I'm, I run Google's open source security team. Um, was uh, lucky enough to work with Luke when we were both at Red Hat a few years ago, um, and got started on Sigstor. I'm also a member of the steering committee. Um, so yeah. Okay, so what was the problem we were seeking to solve? Uh, so I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole here. I'll keep it fairly high level. So pre, to a degree, SIG store, sign-in adoption was very, very poor in open source packaging systems and in general. Most who had adopted something, the usage was around something, typically 0 point something percent. It was very, very low. And we believed a lot of this was to do with the, the user experience. The tooling was quite cumbersome, quite challenging to use, especially challenging to use in the modern idiomatic approaches that we have now of machines that are headless, you know, automation, all of these sorts of typical approaches that we have in the SDLC now. And so we realized that the tooling was cumbersome and was problematic around adoption. Key storage was a big issue. Where do you store your public keys? How do you map them to an identity? How do you safely store your private keys? When should you rotate them? These are all challenges for a lot of developers, okay? And, and especially key compromise being an aspect of that private key storage. If you've got a long-term key, what do you do if your laptop's stolen or a machine is accessed? So, so there was these barriers that appeared to be making it difficult to get traction around the adoption of, of cryptographic signatures and verification. And gaining all the benefits that you do from those fundamentals, you can build a lot, basically, when you have that guarantee, that, that truth, that source of truth with a cryptographic foundation, you can start to stack a lot more things on top. So what we did was, rather than try to build something complex and new, we thought, let's try to look at something similar that's had some success, what's worked, what's got traction. So where could we look around for a similar sort of problem with a solution that worked, that had a, a good, decent outcome? And it, predominantly it was um, HTTP, and you'll note the lack of an S, okay? So for a while, a majority of the internet was running on an insecure communication channel, okay? And a lot of this was the UX again. It was painful. I mean, this was something that was pretty standard. You had to have a credit card to get a HTTPS certificate. You had to go through all these checks back and forth. Then you got a certificate bundle, and you had to kind of work out how do I get this to work in Apache, and how do I configure this? It was cumbersome. It was a cumbersome experience, and it cost money. It cost money. Okay. And then came along a group called Let's Encrypt, and they, they solved the issue of the UX. They made it very simple. You could automate it, and it was free. Okay, so anybody could get a certificate. You could be a large corporation, or you could be the old 12-year-old developer in your mother's basement, as they say. And sure enough, if we look at the patterns, around 2016, prior to that, uh, you know, a majority were not using HTTPS. A majority, sorry, a majority of websites ran unprotected. And then there's this nice up and to the right, effectively, where we're getting close to 100% of uh, websites. A majority of websites now run over a protected medium of HTTPS. And then in parallel to that, I don't know how strong a correlation there is here, but Let's Encrypt released in 2016. And you can see that up and to the right trend. And so I'm not saying it's all down to Let's Encrypt. They're other factors involved, but it, you know, I'm pretty sure it helped. It made it a lot more accessible for hobbyists, community, and people without the financial means to, to purchase SSL, as they were called then, certificates. So what happened was the new normal then became HTTP was unacceptable. Okay, so there was a pushback. The browsers then 
circled. They smelt blood in the water. So now when you go to a website, if it doesn't have a certificate, it kind of feels, do you really want to go there? You get all these red warnings, there will be dragons. It just feels icky. Do you see what I mean? So we managed to shift the paradigm to where the, the default is now a secure channel. So we took this hypothesis and we thought, what if we could apply this to software supply chain in the, you know, the UX, you know, the, the, the kind of the ease of use, the cost free, the automation, all these sorts of things. So Sigstor came around and, and like I say, the North Star was the simple UX. It's gotta be a simple UX. You need to solve the issue of key storage, mapping it to an identity, how to distribute that. That needs to be an intrinsic part. And it needs to be transparent and observable as well. You can't really be facilitating behind closed doors type signing operations. So that's why we selected this technology called a transparency log. And that's one of the first projects that we, we built. And so we then kind of came up with this adage, this saying of become the let's encrypt for software signing. So we found this was the message that really resonated with people. They knew of a, an existing system and effectively how that could be applied to this new system, okay? So I'm not gonna go in depth here. There's, like I said, there's lots of existing documents and tutorials. There's been many, many talks on Sigstor. But predominantly, the, the systems that we introduced was a transparency log. It's an immutable read-only store where we store X509, X509 certificates that contain things such as the public key and they map to an identity effectively, which is typically a, a scope of some sort, a claim. And we have um, a Falsio, which is the certificate authority service, like a web PKI, which distributes these certificates. And then there's various clients and libraries that support the sign-in part of the system, which is typically embedded somewhere within the package manager tools or, or, or some sort of system which can perform the client type operations. And that's a really, really quick 101 on Sigstore. Like I say, there's a lot of folks, some of them sitting here that have really gone in depth into this and you can find various talks out there already. And a pivot that we made from where we started to where we are now, we've always used Open Identity Connect, okay, to establish that map, that credible map between a public key and an identity. And when we started it, it was email, okay? So anybody that used Cosign in the early days, you'd run Cosign, your browser would open, you'd approve an OIDC Connect session, which would give a, a, a signed scope, a testation around the email of the person that approved that OIDC flow. And we would then capture that email within an X559 certificate. So you could see that the person that signed was in control of a particular account with an IDP at a particular time, okay? But what we're doing now is we're focusing on more on workflow-based signing, which is effectively where uh, this token minting and this uh, embedding of the claims, the scopes and so forth, it happens within a, typically a CI provider. So GitHub were one of the early ones to light this up. So what you can do then is you can effectively get a, a good sort of claim around the source of origin, okay? And this really helps for things such as a kind of a level of build reproducibility, source of origin guarantees. It's, it's really sort of a, a helpful foundation to build on top of. So now the focus is predominantly on these workflow-based signing attestations. So uh, a quick wrap up as well, we, we have a, a public good service. So like Lex Encrypt, we realized we needed to run our own infrastructure to support this. So there's a community run service. Okay, so there's a public recall, a public falsio that a majority of community users will leverage for signing and verification. There are people running private SIG store instances, but we run a public community run instance. And so we've hit 101 million signatures since we went GA. There's 33,000 unique GitHub projects. The, the uh, workflow identity support, that's expanded more and more and more, okay? And we have an SLO, which we've conformed with very well, so 99.5%. And, and this is an on-call on rotation system, okay? So there's, uh, there's pager duty and various, do we use pager duty? Yeah, there's, there's various systems. So we act like a proper SRE team, effectively. And there, we've got folks there from Google, GitHub, ChainGuard, StackLock, and Red Hat. 
And a quick update on where we are around community adoption. So NPM was uh, one of the first few package managers to, to uh, integrate SIGSTOR and Salsa Provenance. So you can see the workflow that built a particular, published a particular NPM package or built that package. Uh, there's various ones that are in progress. There's Maven, PyPy, which Bob will talk about. They're making very good progress there. Uh, Ruby Gems was parked for a while, but it seems to have found some life again. This probably should be coupled together with Maven, but we started to speak to some folks from Spring who are interested in looking at sign-in and provenance. Uh, there's Homebrew that just went into beta. And then there's GitHub Actions, which just went GA. Okay, I know Trevor's got a talk coming up about that. And that's, that's some stuff that we use in some of our own projects in Stackrock, like Minder. We, we, we rely on this attestations API to get these guarantees around the source of origin of a project. Over to your good self, Bob. Thanks, Luke. Um, so I, I guess I'm gonna go back a quick slide just to kind of mention here. We talk a lot about signing in the supply chain, um, which people I think tend, to, at least for me, when I think of that statement, I tend to go to the artifact itself, the binary that I've downloaded, the tarball that I've downloaded. But there's actually a lot of other things that you might wanna sign as well. Uh, the one that we typically talk about in many of these ecosystem scenarios is build provenance. So having a very strong link, uh, cryptographic link between the source that went into building something the actual build workflow that generates the output binary and then the binary itself. So when you think of software signing, it's literally not just the blob that you get at the end, it's the metadata that goes along with it. It could be signing the SBOM that you then pass along to your, to your users. All of those pieces of metadata that flow throughout the supply chain need to have those properties that a digital signature gives you. They need to be tied to the identity that generated it, they need to have the property of non-repudiation, and they need to have the integrity guarantee that comes along with what you got was what was sent uh, at the beginning. So when you think about the supply chain and signatures, it's not just that last mile, it's a, it's a comprehensive view. And so I think to that end, that's a nice segue into the, what we did with the homebrew community. And so this was a, a project that we partnered with uh, a couple different entities, uh, folks at Homebrew, uh, folks within the SIGSTOR community, and then OpenSSF has a, uh, a project called Alpha Omega, which is a funding uh, vehicle for doing good work around open source security. And essentially we went to Homebrew and said, look, you're a, if you've ever gone onto a Mac, like mine here, and you want to do any sort of development, most websites will tell you the first step is brew install something. And then you go, okay, well, what's brew? Well, brew is Homebrew. It's a package manager for the Mac OS and Linux, if you didn't know that, they actually have a Linux uh, base as well, where you can go and download commonly used uh, parts of the open source tool chain so that it's easier to do software development, get tools onto your system, and go along your way. That homebrew community is segmented into a centralized group of what they call bottles or binary packages that are centrally managed uh, by the homebrew community itself. And then there's what they call third-party taps that where individuals can manage their own kind of attached ecosystems that relate back to homebrew with a centralized uh, CLI uh, around that. And so as we were talking to the homebrew community, we were learning more about how they actually build and distribute their content. And they're heavy GitHub users. They use GitHub Actions for these core bottles, the 7,000 kind of core packages, if you, you know, the, kind of the, the, the you know, the typical names that you would think of from GCC to OpenSSL to Node to Java, any of those packages that you would do a typical brew and install, these are the same core packages that we're talking about here. They're built on GitHub Actions, they're distributed through GitHub Packages, which is an OCI registry underneath the covers. So if you've ever actually looked at brew install, some of the output, it's going and fetching stuff from GitHub Container Registry and pulling that down onto your system. And so it has this really nice property of where we started with SIGStore, which was, you know, our first use case with Cosign was signing things that went into an OCI registry. We did a lot of work with GitHub and GitHub Actions, and it was this like epiphany of here's a use case that was you know ripe for, for working on together with the community. We just need some focus and some energy to go put these pieces together and bring the benefits of, of various ecosystems together uh, for the users of the homebrew community. So, very uh, a lot of words on this slide, but to quickly walk through the structure of this. Um, we wanted to not just sign the artifacts at, at, at the end uh, that come out of the you know, bottles within Homebrew. We wanted to actually have the provenance for those bottles. How were they actually built? And to have that strong link again back to the source commit. Um, so within the provenance statement itself, we actually have all of this information cryptographically signed and distributed along with the bottle. Um, that does call out to SIGStore. Uh, the public good infrastructure actually is used. Um, the Homebrew Core is a public GitHub project. Um, and so the identity tokens that come out of that are um, 
or, you know, or use the public good infrastructure uh, to get the code signing certificates and upload their results into the transparency log. And then we hand it over to GitHub for the last mile when you're doing the brew install uh, to actually download both the binary bottle itself as well as the attestation. Um, and then the brew CLI actually does the, the client, client, uh, client verification. So when you download something uh, off of a registry, you wanna know all right, who generated it, uh, was it what I expected to see? And when you're downloading build provenance, you have this interesting question of, well, what builder should have built this piece of software? And most of you, like if you've gone to a website and you've downloaded a random tarball, we don't think about where did that tarball came from. We look at the URL and we go, okay, that the green check mark's there, it's probably reasonably good, so it must be good, right? Um, well, as we've seen with things like curl, <laughs> curl bash, uh, that isn't always the case, right? You can't necessarily just trust the random blob that you've downloaded. You need to actually understand where did it come from. And so again, because Homebrew has this property of being centrally built for these core packages, the answer to that question of where should this bottle have been built is actually fairly simple. It's github.com slash homebrew slash homebrew hyphen core and with a specific link to the GitHub Actions workflow that builds uh, those bottles. So it actually makes that question of where could it be built, which I'll get to in the Python scenario, actually is quite different uh, and quite more complex. Homebrew has this nice centralized simplized, uh, simple property that we're, we're taking advantage of. Give you a quick um, view as to the provenance statement. Sorry if that's a little small to read, but this is an in toto attestation which represents the salsa uh, build provenance. Um, it has the information about the artifact that you've downloaded the bottle. Uh, it has a link to the, again, the GitHub workflow that generated it and the SHA, uh, the commit SHA that uh, links back to the source code that was the input of that. So all of this is actually what's flowing uh, over the wire to you. When you do brew install, uh, to, it'll download this build provenance and start to verify that these properties match what you've downloaded. I was on the plane and recorded a quick little demo of this. Um, essentially, I wanted to show that in the latest version of Homebrew, if you do a brew install with a, uh, a Boolean uh, environment variable that's set, um, what will happen is you'll install that bottle, but it will go through and do this verification flow. Uh, we're working with the Homebrew community to test out the bugs and make sure that we've thought through the operational dynamics so that you don't have to set this environment variable. It just happens by default, but we're in beta, so this is what's required. We download this bottle, it does a verification step, and you get this message saying, it's verified. Well, okay, but like, what did it actually do? So what I did here was um, actually show a little bit of the underlying provenance statement, which is, you see these list of hashes here at the top? This is the inclusion proof for proving that the homebrew workflow actually uploaded the build provenance to SIGStore, put it into the record transparency log, and we're rendering that information again back out to the client so that they're not just saying, hey, that there's this salsa provenance thing, it's that the signature itself was put into this public transparency log. And this has this interesting dynamic within the SIG store uh, constructs of being very transparent, very observable, so that we know all signing events that are public should be on this public transparency log, and so I have a way to actually go back and detect, well, what's out there, has my key been compromised, um, so having this information that's in, in the actual attestation that's downloaded really gives you layers of defense and depth that uh, you can look at everything from was it built on the right builder to who signed it to was that signature put into the right place and how many transparency logs was it uploaded to, was the timestamp valid, who attested to the timestamp. You can go through the turtles all the way down to look at the details here. So that's a very quick demo. I would strongly encourage you to attend Trevor's talk. He's gonna go through a much better uh, version of this than what I recorded on the plane uh, on the ride out here. But uh, um, certainly if you're interested, I would definitely look up that talk tomorrow. Uh, Python is the other ecosystem that I wanted to talk about. Um, Python is a community that Luke has spent a lot of time in. Uh, personally is one that we got engaged very early on. Um, and SIGStore Python is our client SDK or library, whatever term you wanna use. It's our reference implementation within the SIGStore community of what good looks like and what we look to aim all of our other language SDKs to ultimately look like and be idiomatic, um, both to the language but also to the spirit of what we're trying to do with SIGStore. And signatures are also not new to the Python community. They had had support within the registry for PGP for a long time and in, I guess, last year there was an audit done that showed, I won't go to the details of this, but you can Google the blog post uh, that was published on the, the PyPI site, Effect effectively like 0.3% of all PyPI uploads were cryptographically verifiable. If you looked at the keys that were there, were the keys discoverable on a key server? And I don't know about you, 0.3% is not really heartwarming to say this is a you know a widely used technology. And so at that time, PyPI made the decision to formally deprecate PGP support uh, from the registry. 
And the community within Python has been making a ton of investment to actually build up a much uh, stronger uh, supply chain story from how you authenticate to upload things to the registry, how do you actually store attestations, um, which is the, the uh, next slide that I'll go to here, and then how do you as a client download that information. So very similar to the homebrew case that I showed, it's, you know, there's client work that I know, you know, I have to answer the question of what did I download and do I trust it? We had, there's work at the registry to actually support storing and verifying that at upload time. And then there's the work at the software publishing time when I actually do the build, how do I sign that, how do I generate the provenance and then upload it to the registry. So the, all of these pieces have to come together in order for a community to reap the benefit uh, of what we've done here. PEP 740, this is the Python enhancement process, is a document that declares what the registry's behavior should fundamentally look like. Um, you know, it talks about uh, what the format of the uh, files should be. Uh, it talks about the verification expectations when we upload something to the registry, as well as what the expectations should be for clients to be, in, uh, to be able to verify that content. Um, and then I mentioned earlier that Homebrew had that nice simple, simple property of everything was built under a simple single repo. Well, that isn't the case in Python. If you imagine there's millions upon millions of packages on PyPI, they're built all over the place. Some people are using GitHub Actions or Circles. Uh, CI or BuildKite or other vendors to go build uh, their, their wheels. Other people are still building it on their local systems and just doing a local push. Um, many enterprises are building things and then submitting it to, to PyPI on their own internal Jenkins clusters. So this question of, okay, well, again, I'm a user. I just want to do pip install foobar. How do I know where foobar should have been built? And that it could be mapped to a GitHub user. It could be mapped to a specific repo in case of GitHub Actions or a, a different provider. It could be any number of things. And so part of what the Python community is going through right now is flushing out what does that model look like? How do we actually codify that identity in a meaningful way that's discoverable? Um, and because this hard-coded mapping of expecting everything in the Python community to come from a single GitHub repo obviously doesn't hold. And this is very similar to what we see with other uh, large ecosystems like NPM and Java, et cetera. The builds are happening a number of different places. Homebrew, again, had this nice property of being simple and straightforward, which we, we love. Um, but we have to solve this problem in the mapping of uh, builder and identity uh, back to the package. And then furthermore, like. The, the, the linking here, and this is going in a, a little bit of the weeds, is how do you actually trust that mapping as it evolves over time? If you think about version 1.0 of FUBAR, well, maybe the mapping was the GitHub Action workflow. But 1.1, they moved to GitLab, or maybe they moved to a, a, you know, a, a different builder. So as I, as a consumer, how do I get that information? How do I trust that information? And how does that evolve as a function of time? Thinking through this, because these mappings are not static, but they're static in the context of a single binary, of a single release. Uh, that would get uploaded. So thinking through how do we evolve that, that mapping as a function of time is a, is a pretty interesting technical problem that we're, we're currently working on. So much more to come like, within the Python ecosystem uh, in you know, the rest of 2024 and into 2025, but we've got great momentum. Uh, the Python SDK is in great shape uh, from a six store point of view, so we're really excited about what's gonna come uh, in, the rest, in the second half of this year. Other things that are coming within the SIGSTOR community, um, we have a, a fair bit of work going on within our other language-specific clients. So SIGSTOR Go um, is our kind of our <laughs> reimagined re uh, Golang implementation of SIGSTOR. We started and did a lot within Cosign, tried to make that user experience very simple, uh, left the API experience under the covers a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit messy. We want to clean that up and fix it. And so. Uh, GitHub was generous enough to donate their initial version of this uh, into the Sigstor community as Sigstor Go, and we've continued to, to, to see community members uh, evolve that and the API service around that, so we'll get to the 1.0 uh, release of that. We've also been investing a lot in Java, uh, as well as Rust from a community point of view, um, so we're hopeful that those will get to the 1.0 milestone uh, this year. And we actually just had uh, Sigstor Ruby, which was, I think, this was something you and I hacked on very early on, was, uh, it was called Ruby hyphen Sigstore until we came up with the nomenclature of Sigstore dash things. Um, it was the first Ruby project I'd ever written, so the code quality was probably not that great, but, um, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, we've had uh, some community members that actually work at Ruby Central that have built up a proper, much better Ruby implementation than what Luke and I originally did and donated that to the Sigstore community as well. So we're working uh, with the Ruby Central folks to look at what does that look like for signing gems, the same sorts of questions around how do we deal with their registry nuances, how do we represent identity, um, there are lots of complex uh, you know, dragons that are buried within each of these different scenarios that we have to work through, but it starts with having a very robust and consistent implementation at the SIGSTOR level. 
Um, to that end, we've been doing a fair bit of work around conformance testing to make sure that as we evolve each of these language clients independently, that we can be guaranteed that their behavior is consistent in the ways that are super important for an underlying crypto library like we are. Um, and then finally, Cosign, which is I think the client that most folks are used to using. Um, we wanted to add what's called bundle support, which is a, an attestation around how do we bundle up all of the different information around what transparency logs did it go in, what timestamps are relevant. Um, we've formalized that. Um, all of our SDKs are supporting the, board of, uh, the bundle format. Cosign hasn't done that yet, but we're, uh, we're gonna add that relatively soon. Uh, and then we wanna replatform Cosign onto SigStore Go so that we have that consistency of interface moving forward. On the services side, um, as Luke mentioned, we're running uh, you know, a production service on behalf of the entire inter internet for free. Um, and we wanna make that <laughs> easier and simpler for the community uh, members that are doing that. Um, part of that is actually moving uh, the underlying transparency log technology towards something that uh, is uh, called tiles. Um, uh, Go actually uses a transparency log underneath its uh, distribution system. Um, and it actually uses this tile-based representation, which is shown to be very scalable and very robust. And so there's a whole community in and of itself around transparency log technology um, that is moving towards more robust tile implementations. And so we want to be an adopter of that technology to drive our cost down as well as just simplify our infrastructure. Um, so we'll get increased scalability, but we'll also get just that lower cost of operation, which is important. I think that, you know the last thing on the services side is Whenever you do something the first time, you learn a lot, and your V2 of the API tends to look a, a little bit different from your V1, and I would say with ReCore, we've learned a lot uh, in hosting that, and so we wanna simplify that API, um, make sure that we're onboarding the right information to make uh, the properties of having a good transparency log, which is having monitors to make sure that the integrity of the log is, is, is valid, having witnesses share that view so that you don't run into something that's called a split view attack where two different people say that the log looked different to them at a given point in time. And so we wanna make sure that ReCore has a very clean API for all of these use cases of putting things into the log as well as actually ensuring the integrity of the log. And then finally, Apparently there's this thing called quantum computing that we have to worry about um, because RSA is gonna become irrelevant very soon. Uh, we've actually started a fair bit of discussion within the SigStore community, uh, looking at the right algorithms, the right libraries to go implement. Um, we don't wanna invent our own crypto here. We wanna make sure that we're moving in lockstep with where the industry is moving. Um, but we also wanna make sure that we're, we're not a laggard when it comes to adopting post-quantum uh, technology. We want to make sure that we're, again, that user experience that people love about SigStore, that it's simple, it's straightforward, I don't have to worry about this complexity. We want to make sure that that's continued uh, going forward. So it'll be an area of focus for us um, into 2025. So Luke, you want to Yeah, sure. So, so to, uh, to wrap up on, give you some of the, uh, the community follow-ups. So I was going to mention, which we, which we did get on the slide. So SigStore Go is going to unlock some other work around open tofu quite keen to use SigStore as well. So there's uh, gonna be some, hopefully some good payloads coming out, out of the work that's happening there. So we have a public roadmap, which is always available, which of course anybody can look at and, and see what our, our devised roadmap is for the future. Uh, there's a GitHub organization that contains all of the repositories, all of these language libraries, clients, uh, the, uh, the the sort of tough sign-in route that we have is verifiable in there, and I think we're probably 50 plus repos at the moment. We're we, uh, 70 now, I think. Okay, yeah. and um, there's a Slack, a very busy Slack that you can join. Uh, we run a status site, so you can see the status of any service at any given time. Uh, we have a blogging platform. Uh, there's community meetings every Tuesday. Hayden is here at the back. Hayden chairs the community meetings. Uh, the TSC meets every Thursday every other Thursday, sorry. Uh, that's, you'll always find myself, Bob, Trevor, and a few of the TSC folks there. And there's the SIGs as well. So we have special interest groups around clients, uh, various sort of uh, collections that have got a specific domain uh, experience and interest in a particular area of SIG store. So they meet, and we have a community calendar. It's a Google calendar, so you can peruse that and see which ones are of interest to you. And uh, with that, it's a wrap. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. And me and Bob can do questions, of course. We're both here for a while. So, yeah. So, yeah. Do we do questions? Is there a microphone, that type of deal, or is it? If you want.
You can just rock up and ask us. It'd be yeah. easier. You raise your hand, or if you just want to come up and ask afterwards, that's fine too. Yeah, so. Yeah, okay, sure, yeah. So you said you're from Uber? Yeah, okay, so um, let's talk afterwards, okay? And uh, we do have a, a community around people that run Sigstore in a private context. So there's, there's a little, you know, well not little, there's a significant amount of people that have, have walked the same journey as you. So let, let's have a chat afterwards. We can get you in, tapped into the community channels and get you some support. Just for the YouTube recording, there, docs.sigstore.dev, uh, there is a whole section around what it looks like to run a private instance, yeah. so I would certainly refer you to that as well. Um, the, you know, there's some interesting nuances around the transparency dynamic there because you don't have a public uh, dynamic of wh how do you monitor the integrity of the log if you're running that privately. Um, so there are some uh, options that, um, from a deployment point of view that you can consider um, what makes sense for your threat model. Um, so starting down this journey it really does need to start with a threat model to make sure that you understand what it is that SigStore offers and what threats it mitigates and which ones that it doesn't. Um, and so we've outlined what our threat model is from a SigStore public point of view, and then you can you certainly use that as a template to, to drive your discussion of what it makes sense for what you're trying to do internally. So, Hello there. Yeah, so, so we always used to use, so we, we, li we like to capture a, a scope or a claim, which is typically signed by an IDP of some sort, okay? So for example, Google, you can request a scope of an email address, okay? And then you get a validation, a cryptic validation that whoever authorized an open identity connect session is in control of a particular account. So you've probably seen it used as a kind of a single sign-on or a sort of a borrowed sign-in type system. So when we started, we used to use that as a means to capture a map between the public key and, of course, the private key that was used at the time of sign-in to an identity, because then I could trust Bob at google.com okay, as, a, as a signer of a particular artifact. Okay. Now, what we've done since then is we've moved to workflow-based sign-in identities, which is where... Uh, Typically, a CI system will run. Uh, they'll have a set of claims or scopes. Could be the code repository, the workflow that built an artifact. And they will sign those effectively. Okay? And we can be sure that it's uh, that provider that signed those scopes. And those are then put into a certificate. And then you can do the similar thing where instead of me checking that Bob at Google signed something, I can check that it was signed or generated, rather, that the artifact was generated within a particular provider's infrastructure, a CI provider. Does that make sense? Do you want to, Bob, did I? Yeah, I would say, like, when we started. The question was why. Oh, why? So, so, okay, so why? right, right, yeah. So, so, so you want me to take a look? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. So I think when we started the project, there was not wide scale adoption of workload identity. And so by starting, we, want, we knew we wanted to start with OpenID because it had this fundamental property of otherwise Sigstore has to hold passwords and be kind of an identity provider itself. We didn't want to go down that route. Um, and so OpenID Connect made a lot of sense, starting with email uh, and kind of the, the flow there made sense. But as we saw platforms like GitHub, GitLab, many of the CI providers actually step up and offer those uh, workload identity kind of natively within the platform, it solved two things. Number one is it gets humans out of the loop, and so you talk about the security of the code platform and the actual repository itself, rather than the security of somebody's physical credentials. And it also solves some operational concerns around how do I log in and have a browser launch in the middle of my CI workflow? Who actually clicks the button? And do I have to block the progress of my build so that a developer comes in and clicks a button to log in with, with Facebook or log in with Google or whatever it might be? So. It was both the kind of the, the rise of workload identity as a, as a paradigm within the, the broader CI platform, as well as these operational concerns of I don't want to block a build for a developer to have to do something. I want it to be fully automated. And so it has this nice property of then removing humans and having privacy concerns that are introduced as part of that and having it linked back to a system of truth, which could be GitHub, it could be GitLab, it could be the source code system of record, which then allows you to have a different conversation around not human behavior, but just here's the system that we can all look at and observe together. So. 
All right, we got time for, well, I think we're at time. Uh, Trevor, maybe one quick question from you. Just for posterity on YouTube, Chris wrote about native conferences for gaming being one of those big four organizations that will help you verify signatures in a Kubernetes context. There is. Yep. Thanks for asking. So we have a project called uh, Policy Controller. Uh, which is a, a, a full Kubernetes admission controller. We've also done a ton of work with Kyverno uh, and other policy engines on top of the uh, on top of the Kubernetes ecosystem that use uh, Cosign under the covers or uh, some of our other libraries to actually drive validation uh, at runtime when you launch a new deployment or you launch a new state uh, uh, in a replica set. Um, you can do that verification at that time. Um, so we have examples of what that looks like, what it looks like to actually sign Kubernetes manifests and have them be verified at the time of uh, uh, application onto a cluster. So all of those, um, are there's examples of those within the SIGSTOR community. Um, and so policy control is probably the most popular version of that. So. And it also merits mentioning that we have a lot of Helm charts and all the machinery needed to run a private SIGSTOR instance, which would be relevant to the discussion around running a private SIG store. Yeah, our, our public instance runs on top of Kubernetes, yeah. um, so this is what we operate on day in and day out. Um, so if you've got any other questions, I invite you to come up. Thanks for attending, appreciate the time. Thank you.